Well, hello, folks, and welcome to the Dieter Metal Horn Fishing Podcast. I hope you're having a good day, whatever day it is that you happen to be checking out the show. If you're watching the podcast, which you can do on YouTube, thanks for stopping by and checking it out on this platform. Or if you're listening on any of the popular podcast streaming platforms out there, thanks for checking it out. Today, I've got an interview with a guy that I think may be changing the game in tournament catfish fishing. It is a long podcast. It is a good one. It is an in-depth uh, in depth discussion about fishing for catfish, tournament fishing in the tournament world. So hopefully you will stay tuned for that. I think it will be very informative and enlightening uh, what we talked about, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, first, uh, anybody who's a regular listener, I appreciate you coming back. Thanks for sticking with this channel, sticking with the platform, sticking with YouTube, sticking with the podcast, wherever it's at. And if you're new, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for checking it out. Anybody that wants to send me any type of message, question, comment, uh, go to my website, DieterMelhornFishing.com. And uh, you can go to the contact section, reach out to me there, send me an email, shoot me a text. Uh, it's also where you can reach out to me if you're looking to do a guide trip. I do guided fishing trips here in the Carolinas, and that's the best way to get a hold of me there on that platform. Also, if you're looking for a hoodie, you're looking for a mug, a tumbler, uh, t-shirts also, hit me up through there. I've got all that stuff now in stock, finally. I think we've even got some t-shirts, some big ones, three, four, five X ones. So some of uh, you uh, larger guys and gals, we've got that stuff in stock. So anyway, enough with the sales pitches and the shameless plugs. Uh, I went down to Santee Cooper this past weekend. Uh, there was a tournament down there called the Sweet 16, the King Cat Sweet 16. And uh, it was basically 16 anglers, the top guys in the points and gals from last season in the King Cat series, formerly known as Cabela's King Cat. Any of you folks that have fished tournaments over the years, like myself, uh, have heard the name Cabela's King Cat. And uh, it was one of the first, uh, almost really the only, nationwide catfish tournament series. It held the Super Bowl of catfish tournament fishing, uh, the Cabela's King Cat Classic. We all look forward to, you know, fishing that tournament, qualifying for it. Uh, it was in different places around the country, and it was the premier event. It was the Super Bowl. It was the one that everybody wanted to fish and wanted to win. Sadly, uh, over a period of years, that tournament series started to go downhill. Uh, the reasons were many. Uh, there were a lot of things that went wrong. It was an unbroken chain of events. Some of it, uh, some have argued, could be attributed to a lust to make more money off of the series. Uh, some have blamed poor leadership. Some have blamed good leadership that left to go somewhere else because they could see the writing on the wall. There's a lot of reasons. Um, and then there were some things that went wrong in some of the tournaments. Uh, there were allegations made that dead fish were weighed in, allegations made that undersized or oversized fish were weighed in, a lot of different things, none of which were addressed or handled in a way that the public saw and the public could respond to positively. The result? the number of people showing up for these tournaments declined significantly to where there were only a handful of people showing up to fish these tournaments. Most of the local uh, fruit jar tournaments were putting more anglers in the boat than the then Cabela's King Cat was doing with their tournaments. The tournament series changed hands. It was sold. And just uh, to give a little background on it, and I think we get into this in the podcast a little bit, is this was not run by Cabela's. Cabela's was just a sponsor. This was a private company that is known for doing crappie fishing tournaments. And um, they are a business, and they make money putting on crappie fishing tournaments. Uh, they got into the catfish world with the sponsorship from Cabela's. And... Um, that's how they were running it. The uh, leadership of the company, I think, was aging out of the business. And I think there was a, maybe a little less concern with what was going on. This may have led to the demise, the demise of the organization. Um, 
with that said, uh, that's over and done. Uh, it, it is now under new ownership. Uh, the people who ran it before have nothing to do with it whatsoever uh, in any way, shape, or form. There's a new owner, and I heard about him last year at the uh, Catfish Conference. And uh, some people said, hey, you ought to talk to this guy. He's, you know, different. And, you know, I, I've honestly had a sour taste in my mouth for Cabela's King Cat, the former tournament series, and some other tournament series, because honestly, I think a lot of it was money oriented and uh, nothing wrong with that. that that's a fine way it's a business model that works and you got to make money you got to you know you got to make money doing it and have no problem with that but uh as far as having something to talk about i'm not really too interested in talking about to somebody about oh they're a great big payout and how much money they're going to pay up there's not a lot of depth there there is not a lot of takeaway for you, the listeners that are listening to it. All you're doing is hearing somebody basically giving you a sales pitch. And uh, my next guy, I had a different feeling about after a phone conversation. Now, granted, he is a promoter. He is promoting his tournament, no doubt. But I think there is some depth to him um, and a little different perspective that, quite honestly, I have not seen with some other people in the tournament world. And uh, I got to sit down with him, sit down with him at the King Cat Sweet 16 tournament. I have to think not to say Cabela's now because it is really different. It is rebranded. Now, they, I think they are having Cabela's and Bass Pro Shops come on this year as a sponsor. It's a one-year deal. So uh, we'll see if that stays or if it goes away. But... I have to get that out of my head. It is now King Cat. It is a different animal, different leadership, different people, different philosophy, and a different outtake. And Bob Deenan, this guy who wants it now, uh, was gracious enough to sit down with me in the middle of this tournament going on. Uh, they had just weighed fish in the night before. They were getting ready to weigh fish in a couple hours later, and he sat down with me, and we had a long chat on camera, which you guys are going to get to hear. And uh, we had a nice chat off camera, too. Um, I've got some respect for the guy and what he's doing. Uh, do I think he's crazy? He's close. He's close. He's really biting off a lot, to be perfectly honest. What he is attempting to do, nobody has attempted to do before. What he's dreaming about, uh, nobody has attempted to do before. So uh, I think one of his quotes from the podcast is... Uh, uh, I, I, I'm a gambler, or uh, something to the effect of I've I, I, I going in big, I've gambled twice, I, I've lost twice, I've been broke twice, and he's not afraid to do it again, and uh, that's good. The great thing is uh, he has the financial backing uh, himself to float this for a while from what I'm seeing, and that's a good thing. Uh, I think one of the things that was can drive a tournament into the ground and may have contributed to the prior ownership was the desire and have to to make money right away and very quickly and um, that can be a a it can be a bad thing uh, especially in the wrong hands of the wrong people and uh, we get into some talking about the money uh, we get into some talking about some of the high payout tournaments that are out there and uh, he was pretty candid with me I appreciate it. I want to thank him for doing that. I think you guys will find it entertaining and informative. And if you're new to fishing for catfish or thinking about fishing in a tournament, this may be one for you because one of his goals, uh, you'll see what he says about this, is to make this affordable. Instead of these $500, $1,000, dollars $5, entry fees, he's trying to come up with a way to make it more affordable for entry-level angler, anglers to get into it uh, so it doesn't cost you a fortune to compete like it did with the previous owners. It was costing a lot of money to fish one tournament. I think at one time we ran the numbers with all the membership fees and joining fees and late fees and everything. It was going to cost you right at $400 to enter one of these tournaments. I think he's going to make it a lot more affordable than that. But uh, Bob Dean is the guy's name. I sit down and talk with him here down at Santee Cooper. I hope you enjoy it. Let's go back and try to paint a picture of who you are, because that's going to be honestly the biggest question from people is who the heck is this guy? Where are you from? When did you get started fishing for anything? 
Um, I'm from, I'm originally from Cambridge, Ohio. Right now, um, my home base is Young, uh, Youngstown, Ohio. And I started fishing with my Uncle Bill when I was little, five, six years old. We would go to a corner of Wills Creek that they would call Catfish, I think they called it Catfish Basket. And it was a, it was a, it was a bend in Wills Creek that had a deep hole in it. And we'd walk in the, in the dark and we'd set up there. We did what was called midnight fishing, have a little fire going. And that was my first experience in, in catfishing with uh, my Uncle Bill. And, and um, grew up, my mother died when I was very young and um, was raised by my grandmother. Um, and never really knew my father. And so my Uncle Bill became really my hero in my life. And so he'd come give me just a, come on, Bob, we're going fishing. And we'd just take off and go fish all day or on a Saturday or on a Friday night late. And, and, and I remember several times I would walk to the bank and I would wake up in the backseat of the car on the way home. Um, and he'd be dragging me out. And uh, that's when I really started to get the, the image or the, the feeling of what, cat, what catfishing did, but in general, what fishing did. And, and then we would go during the daytime and fish on the lake banks and stuff like that. Never fished from a boat. Um, <clears throat> and so fast forward real quick, uh, I ended up um, getting married fairly young. I think we were 18 or 19 when we got married. Started working for a company most people would remember or know uh, now, uh, Murphy Phoenix Company, which makes Murphy's Oil Soap, mm -hmm. um, which is out of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, did that for about 14 years. Uh, started youth pastoring a local church, small local church. And, um, that moved into senior pastoring. And then that moved into an after-school program where we were helping youth in our, in our church area. Um, and I run a residential treatment center for the living. Um, we have several people, we have over 100 employees, and, and we help uh, disadvantaged kids that's been st stuck in the system that are pretty beat up and wounded. And so we have a very large campus. We have 68 kids that live on campus 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And um, so kind of got my hands in a lot of little things. We've got several different companies that feed into that. Um, it started to take off and do its own thing and really didn't need my overall oversight. Um, and so we decided to start crappie fishing. And so my first crappie fishing was in Lake Wiley and with Crappie USA. And I got to new, meet a lot of neat people and we got hooked on the tournament trail and, and up till last year was pretty serious with it. And that's when I started to hear that King Cat was available. And I had somebody in the business ask me, do you even catfish? And I went, no, and they just laughed at me. That's what they did. Um, but there's a passion, there's a couple passions that's involved. Number one, the importance of youth and, and how we're missing that today um, overall na nationally. Um, there's not a lot of Uncle Bill's that's taking youth out fishing right now. Um, and, and just the whole passion of, of getting out, enjoying the outside and, and the whole thing. So there's a lot of things that I've done in my life that have brought me to this. Um, have I caught my first 60 pounder? Nope. Uh, my team is guaranteeing that they're taking me out tonight and we're gonna get my first 60 pounder tonight. I told them I don't know. We'll see. Uh, so everybody's anxious. I've got a lot of anglers now that's anxious to get me out on the boat and get my first you know, trophy catfish. Uh, but it's a business sense for me. It's not about making money. Uh, it's, it's about taking something that was very wounded King Cat was very wounded as far as an organization. And that was interesting to me. Uh, that made me really think, you know, we, we've, we've had the history over the years with my family of taking kids that are wounded and putting them back, trying to put them back together and get them some direction. And what we found out more than anything else is when we would get a very difficult young person and the therapist could not reach that young person, uh, they would call me and say, hey, they called me Pastor, they called me Pastor Bob at home. They said, Pastor Bob, would you go take such and such fishing? And so I'd go grab him or, or, or her with another person, and, and we would head out to the lake. And within 10 minutes of this kid being very, very difficult on being on the water, he began to talk about how grandma took him out or his aunt would take him out, or I went fishing with my father before he died. And we begin to see something. And, and just spending an hour or two on the lake, I was able to accomplish more in that hour or two with that kid than what we had in six weeks with therapy. So we just ramped it up. And now when we have difficult young people, my phone's on speed dial and they're like, we got four that needs to go out fishing. 
and we'll take them fishing. And what we see is that it's a breakthrough moment for us, getting them outside, letting them experience and, um, and there's always a memory that comes out. And so it's really therapeutic in a lot of things of what we do. Um, and then when King Cat came available to buy, um, I talked to a couple partner friends of mine that uh, work with me, um, my son and um, my CFO, uh, trying to get them to convince me not to do it. And they felt after looking at the uh, performa and what we have a passion, for, what we want to do long term um, and, and try to bring some change to the industry, which we're not sure what that is yet. But I think there needs to be some changes uh, moving forward. So we decided to be the first one to blow through the door that really don't know much about catfishing, but we know a lot about people um, and, and we know a lot about how to run business correctly and, and see if we can make this thing the way I think it can be. Yeah. So give some people some background. There's going to be a lot of people that are not going to be familiar with King Cat, the new brand. Right. They may have heard of the old brand, Cabela's King Cat. Right. Explain to people what that is. There's a lot of people that thought Cabela's ran it. Explain the whole dynamic of how something like that works with a uh, with a okay. tournament series. Years ago, when Crop USA was in and had came into the the industry for the crappie industry, they had always done this thing called I think it was called Crappie Thon. And when Crappie Thon was really was put together by Johnson's. Um, I think it was Johnson's Outdoors is what I think it was. And and so when they when Johnson's Outdoors ended Crappie Thon, Crop USA took over. And then there was a talk with Cabela's to do a catfish line. They wanted to do some things with catfishing. And so Cabela's said, okay, let's do a catfish on, on right next side to Crop USA. And so thus King Cat was born out of that. Uh, Cabela's at that time, Cabela's and Bass Pro were separate. So there was that competition within the industry. Cabela's really wanted to get their heads and their feet into different things when it comes to the outdoors. And so they basically mirrored up with King Cat and said, okay, we're going to be, we're going to be together. It was a sponsorship, but it wasn't advertised as a sponsorship. It, it, it grew its own name of Cabela's King Cat when it really was King Cat presented by Cabela's is what it was. But everybody knows us as Cabela's. All right. Well, then you had the merger of the two mega people that come together. And now you got Johnny Morris's with Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's is what you've got. And we've signed a one year deal with them for this year. Uh, we're in negotiations. We're looking at industry a little differently right now. Uh, so Bass Pro is on board with us for this year, but they're only the presenting sponsor. We're evaluating how we're going to redo the presenting sponsors long term. I think it might have outgrown the way it is right now. And we need to look at things through a business mind a little differently. Um, but we're glad that uh, Bass Pro's on board with us this year. Uh, we're not, the reason why we rebranded is what we did was we felt the brand was old, a little tired, a um, little busy. And so we put a lot of work over the last six months with some professionals and, and sat down and said, how can we redo the branding? And one of the things that we want to do is we want to have standard badging, but we want that badging to be able to be changed in anything, just like with our Sweet 16 this week. The, the badging's been changed for the Sweet 16. Uh, we can do this for, if we want to do a, a veterans of, event, we can do a, a different background on the badging that'll bring it. If we want to do something special for women or for cancer awareness or whatever, we can make a change very quickly um, is what we can with this, but yet keep the focused um, logo the way it needs to be. So we just kind of updated everything. Um, we're really not known, uh, we're known through the industry as Cabela's King Cat, but we're King Cat. And I had a lot of people when we first started said, I want nothing to do with you because I can't get my product in your stores. And I'm like, well, I'm not Cabela's, I'm King Cat. And there was a real big misunderstanding. And I think there still is in the industry today because we still have a lot of people, you know, and you know, Cabela's King Cat has been part of the fishing industry for so long. You can't just go in and click a button and make that all go away. And, and so we're slowly edging ourselves in great history with Cabela's have nothing but great to say about that and what's going on. But as we move forward, we're trying to take it up a new notch. And so we're looking um, differently throughout out, outside of the industry uh, to try to bring more financial security to the anglers is what we're trying to do. And just to be clear, so people know and understand, because like I said, I've got people watching this that don't really have a clue about any of this. You're not the same guy that used to run the Cabela's King Cat. No, no we bought we bought King Cat um, 
it'll be one year next month. Yeah. Uh, what had happened was um, the original owner, which was Daryl Van Vactor, mm -hmm. um, sold it to a company up in Louisville. He sold both, both brands, Crop USA and King Cat. Um, they had it for three or four years. Um, King Cat started to falter a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, for whatever reason, I you know I'm I don't know I wasn't on the inside, but we knew as an industry there was some there's some issues that was going on, and so then they decided to sell it. So they decided they sold it to um, Blake Jackson and Angela Jackson, uh, which is in um, they sold both both of it to Angela and them really didn't want to do the King Cat side of things. They wanted to do do the crappie side of things, mm -hmm. and so uh, they quietly put it on the market. Um, we didn't approach them. They approached us, wanted to know if we were interested in it. I like the history. I like the legacy. I'm a big legacy kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And and I began to look at the legacy of even Crop USA and King Cat four years ago because I knew Daryl was getting ready to retire. And, and, and so I was like, well, what's going to happen with this legacy, you know, uh, as far as the the branding goes and, and what is accomplished over the years and how it really set the stage for so many years. And then it faltered. It lost its way. And so when, when we decided to buy it, um, my son looked at me and he's part owner. He says, Dad, what's your biggest fear? And, and I said, we're going to have our first tournament and no one's going to come. <laughs> and um, it was a real fear because, I mean, it had been very wounded. It had, and I'm not, it, it's not to blame anyone. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Mm -hmm. And so there was a, just a leadership void within the King Cat side of things. And you, it's too big and you're trying to, you, if you're going to do something nationally, you can't cheap it. Uh, you, you got to put a lot of attention to it or you're just going to be just this other trail that's going to just be a local trail. But there's nothing wrong with that. We need them. Mm -hmm. But then you've got the national spotlight on you and then you falter. You know, you bring dead fish into the to the way in. Um, you know, you disqualify people that didn't need to be disqualified. You measure fish wrong. Those are the things that was going on, and it didn't take long for everybody to say, "Ooh, don't want to be part of this." And that was the thing I saw, really saw with it. It was not once; it was an unbroken chain of little events that led to it. That's all done. That's in the past. Yep. You can't unring that bell. Was it the legacy that made you? buy into this versus just starting your own thing and being done and not having to deal with any of that? The name was wounded and everybody told me that I had talked to that we'd be better off just to start our own. But as I work with young people 24 hours a day that is wounded, I have this passion to take stuff that's tore up and see if I can fix it. And, and I think that, and I don't know for sure, but I think that was one of the driving forces behind me doing it. It was like, this thing is really, really in trouble. I don't know if we can save it, but let's try. You know, there's a there's a good enough name, there's a good enough history that I think we can redeem. Was it on life support? Yeah, it, it was on life support. Um, and, you know, when it comes to sponsorships, um, they were running away and already a lot of them had run away. Um, and I didn't even approach sponsorships. I just said, we just got to go in, we got to take care of the anglers and we got to show them that we want to help the industry in every way that we can. And, and, you know, the spotlight's still on us. We're, we're going to make mistakes. You won't do it. You're, you're going to have a dead fish. You don't want one, but it's, it's going to happen if you, you know, you're, but we're doing everything that we can to pr protect it, to educate, um, especially our anglers and our, our, the local waterways when we come. We try to get someone officially with the Department of Resources there and teach them to say, hey, this, this fish that's 60 pounds is, it's probably 30 years old, and we try to do a lot of education to the local body of people that come to watch it, and also through our TV show, uh, of this is a resource we really need to take care of. And so we've been blessed so far. We've got a really good team. I went searching throughout the United States to try to get people that really understood catfishing, since I didn't. Um, it was like i got to surround myself with people that know more than I know. Um, I can bring the business side of things. We can bring the financial need that needs to be there. But I need to have somebody that knows what they're doing. And so with our team that we brought together, um, it was just, it just, it, it was amazing. It was, I, we've always called it as the team, we call it, it's a God moment because we were all strangers at the beginning. And the interviews were done on, online or was done by the phone. And it was after just doing some praying about it and getting good feelings. It was like, we're going to go here, we're going to go there. This person's coming on board. And we just slammed us all together last year. 
um, and it's been it's been a good ride as far as the team goes. Cabela's was really when I started fishing tournaments that was the Super Bowl. King Cat Classic was the Super Bowl event. It was really the only national Correct. tour. Yep. And obviously, you believe a national tour can work. There's really not one right now. Why do you believe that? I think there's something that's important to the national trail idea. Do I know what that idea is right yet? I don't have all the answers. I don't. But I think there's, there's, a, there's this importance to I mean, anybody can go run a one-day or two-day event. And, and we got a lot of guys that are doing it, and they're knocking it out of the park. They're doing a great job. But to truly do a national trail, I believe, has a lot to say about what is it. First of all, we want to leave something better when we leave the area. Then We don't want to just take it from the area. We want to leave something, whether it's education, whether it's helping local clubs out. Um, I, in 2024, we're going to be really pushing a grassroots project. This year, we've changed up how we're bringing affiliate clubs to be part of what we're doing. We're really going to focus next year on uh, grassroots. My goal right now nationally is to see, it's not to get 100 boat tournaments. I don't know if we'll ever, ever have a 100 boat tournament. I don't know. That's not my goal. My goal is to get 100 new people fishing a national trail this year that's my goal nationally the big picture not sure how we'll get there yet is that we will have not regions but districts in the united states we will have equipment set up in each region and we will have directors and teams that will be in those regions and their job will be to support that local region within that resource and then at the end of the year we'll bring all the regions together to do the classic and then out of the classroom, we're going to bring our Sweet Six team in to have the national championship where that's an invite uh, that you'll come through that. So nationally, I guess that, and that's a long way to get around about what do I see about nationally. Um, I, I think that I think the, to being part of a national tournament has some value to it. Um, I'm not sure that it's ever been reached. You know, we say it's national. Um, We've never been to California, you know. So how do you make it national? And, and, and the importance of the national, anything that I look at national, if we just look at the United States, you have the national government that helps with the smaller state governments. I guess my mind's kind of wrapped around that a little bit. I want to be a, I want to be support to the local fisheries that, that if, we, if we can get big enough, we can bring change to that area, whether it's in conservation, education, wh whatever it would be, that we would have enough um, value to it that we, when we come in, we can add to that community. It's really what I want to do. One of the big trends right now is big payouts. People want to see a big payout. And under most business models for catfish tournaments, that means you have to have a high entry fee. And we're seeing more and more of those four or $5,000 entry fees. Your plan is to kind of go in and, and as I've said before, I think that makes those tournaments gamblers tournaments. Pays that, they, most of them pay out very low down the field so they can keep that first place number really, really high. You, from what I'm hearing, some of your stuff is more oriented toward, like you were saying, getting new people in there, lower entry fees, more affordable entry fees is probably the best word. Do you think that is a better business model for the entire industry, especially, and not just for, and when I say industry, not necessarily the tournament industry, but the sport itself and conservation. Do you think that's going to be a better business model? I think what you have going on right now is you have, you have some elite fishermen that want bigger money. And there's always been this talk. There was this talk in the crappie world stores today. How do we become like bass? Well, I don't like that statement. We're not bass. We're catfish. And I truly believe that no one really understands what the industry will do for catfishing until we begin to approach it that way. Right now, the mindset is get sponsors, get a lot of boats, you're successful. Okay? My thinking is take care of the anglers, take care of the resources, and you'll get sponsors. That's kind of my approach to it right now. And... So when I look at the big payouts and, you know, the elites, the elites want the big payouts. Well, I mean, we're starting this year, we're doing what's called a signature series. And what the signature series is, is we've picked seven lakes that's going to be signature points only. And there's a high pay-in for that point system. It's $2,000. 
and then we're going to pay out 100%. If we can get some sponsors eventually to back it, we'll pay out more than 100%. We're doing that for the elite is what we're doing. But we want to keep the entry fee around $300. My goal, entry fee low, payout's huge. Well, how do you do that? Well, first of all, you got to do 100% payout, number one. Number two, you got to get sponsors to buy into what you want to do, okay? And the sponsors have to help with the payouts. So if we get 300 well, let's say $300 and we get 50 boats to show up. My goal, $50,000 minimum payout, okay? And you can't do that in the way the system is set up right now, okay? A lot of people want to push and say, we have a $100,000 payout, but it costs you three grand to get in. And that's fine. That's okay. You're not going to do that on a national s scale. Even in some areas, $300 is too much to get that new angler to come on board, okay? And so we're evaluating that whole system of what it is. And we're discussing, I'm leaving the catfish industry with my com communications with sponsorships. And I'm going to bigger areas and markets on sponsorships. And this is our learning year. This is, we wanted to get the one year behind our belt. This is our learning year to listen to say what they want if they want to become a part of what we're doing. And so we're setting down and we're starting to have conversations with very large corporations and, and try to understand what is it that we can partner. Because a sponsorship is 100% partnership. That's what it is. If you're, not, if you're just taking the money from the sponsor, it, you're not helping them. And, and I can say, well, come and join us and we're going to put your logo out there and, and we're going to have 50 boats. That's not worth anything to that sponsor. They, it takes an awful lot of selling hooks to pay for that sponsorship. And what are they, what's the image that they're getting out of it? So the first thing we did was we had a TV show with Crop USA. So the first thing this year what we did was we went ahead and put a, a TV show, a 13-week TV show on catfishing uh, on the Pursuit Channel. So we're getting more volume uh, as far as look uh, views. And then we're really... I've got a team of people that really understands multimedia, and we're taking our time to do it the way it needs to be done. Um, so I think there's little pieces of all of it. You've got to take care of the angler. You've got to take care of the area of water that you're fishing, and you've got to take care of the sponsor. And my goal is to get sponsors to pay the payouts um, and keep the entry fees as low as possible. Will I be able to accomplish it? Don't know. We're paying a lot of money right now to do what we're doing, but we've got a game plan and a performa set up for three years. And we, uh, TJ, which is an owner, my son Andy and myself, uh, we've got a three-year plan uh, to try to get it to that way. So we're putting a ton of investment into it and saying, okay, we're going to see what the industry is going to want, what the industry doesn't want. Um, and um, I know I've got a lot of, there's a few people that's approached me in the industry and said, uh, uh, we don't like you doing it this way, that you're messing everything up. And I'm like, it's okay, you know, it's okay. Let's see, because I believe that if you, if you just do the same old thing, you get the same old result. And I think it's, you gotta have somebody that can just come in and say, let's look at this differently. How can we look at this differently? There is a lot of advertising money in the world that will jump on this if you give them the right product. And the biggest thing that I've been working on in the first year is to eliminate drama. I want no drama around King Cat. And we, we won't get into it online. If you got a problem, if I see somebody that's got something that they want to say online, I'm instant messaging them saying, pick up the phone, call me, let's talk. And by the time we're done talking, they understand and everything goes that way. In the world of the wild, wild west of the internet, people can say a lot of things about you and you don't need to really screw up. If you do screw up, you're really in trouble. But you really don't even need to screw up to get someone to get negative against you. And so we're trying to just come in, massage it a little bit to say, okay, what's working, what's not? When we get cut, when we get a bruise, okay, wait a minute, let's look at this. Why did it come this way? And, and, and try to just see how we can bring new blood into the industry. And it comes down to the fact of what are they getting out of it? Yeah. Complicated question, but it all ties back to one thing. With what you're doing, first of all, I agree 100%. There's no point in doing what the old Cabela's King Cat did. You gotta do something different, otherwise you're just pounding your head into the wall. Very smart. Are we at the point, or are we close at the point, or when do you see it being to where we have 
true professional tournament anglers, similar to the bass world, where they're making a living off of tournaments. And I ask that because this is where it gets complicated. I think to have that, I think you need that because you need the Mike Iaconellis, the Kevin Van Dams, the names. Right now, the guys that are fishing this tournament, nobody knows who they are outside of a few tournament people. Right. And that's the biggest thing in anywhere in the catfish tournament world. It's really a small group of people. It's maybe 4,000 anglers nationwide. Right. And for this to work, to reach non-endemic sponsors, Chevron or uh, you know the big names out there that aren't tied to fishing, you gotta have some kind of identity that people can latch onto when they're watching a the tournament. They may never fish a tournament, they're like, oh, I want to see if so-and-so can overcome this, whatever. How close do you think we are to getting that point to where we can put guys on a national trail that will be able to fish all of them? I think if we do our work right, I think we're within five years. And that's if. That's a big if, okay? The, any industry, not just catfish, you may, any industry will get stuck in a rut your sponsors will get in a rut. And before you know it, you get that 4,000. It's like, and I look at it almost like the church world. You get a new pastor down the street on another church, and half of this church leaves this church and goes to him because they like him. That church, now, that, new, that new pastor, he didn't grow anything. He just, there was just transplants. They didn't change the city, okay? And so I think a lot like that. I don't want other people that's connected with other trails or tournaments, if they want to fish, it's great. But if we're going to really grow this way it needs to be, it's all about new. You know, I, I saw a statistic the other day where 18 million cat fishermen in the United States is the number I saw. I don't know how true that number is, but there was 18 million, okay? We need to figure out what we got to do to educate them. We need to, how, how do we, and then out of that, with the exposure of a national trail, I believe, then you get more exposure of where you're hand, not just handing hats out, but you're letting them talk to the people that's, that just caught that 60-pounder. And, and, and you spend some time one-on-one -on -one with the crowd that's there. Uh, you know as much as I know that influence is everything. It's where you're getting your influence from and who's talking the loudest and who's listening to it. I always use a John Maxwell scenario, 20, 60, 20. If the top 20 percent is talking, 60 percent is going to follow. The bottom 20 that's going to be there just to cause you problems. Eventually, most of them will come up reluctantly and will follow. But if that bottom 20 is talking and it, louder than the top 20, then you got that 60% that's going to follow whosoever's listening the most. And I just want to be, I want to be that top voice of saying, okay, let's talk, let's learn together. Um, everybody wants to do it, but no one knows how. And I'm not so sure I know how. But I think we need to have an open mind to say, okay, let me give you a perfect example. There's our Sweet 16. When we first approached the city here that we're in doing the Sweet 16 this weekend, and the first question they asked me, how many boats do you have? Well, I got 16. Six, just 16? Yeah, I got 16. Well, that's not very many heads in the beds. You got to keep in mind the CVBs wants heads in the beds. That's how they get their money. We went to, we flew out to Mississippi, and we're going to do a Mississippi challenge this year. And we flew out, and we spent two days with the CVBs in Mississippi. And, and when they asked me a question, they said, well, we're ready for your, you know, your, go ahead, your presentation. Economic impact. And I said, I don't have one. And they just looked at me, and I said, I don't have one. I said, I have a question to ask you. How do you get your money? How do you get your money? Where do you get your money from? And then let's find out if we can do something that will help you. And, and I think that that has to be the talk. CVBs want the people to come in, they want the big, they want that. What we did was we sat down and said, let me tell you about the exposure you're going to get off of the Sweet 16, because this is the first one. And this is gonna be huge. I see this one being a $100,000 payout. Anglers don't pay a dime to be here. I pay for their housing, no entry fees. I'm feeding them and we gave them free clothing. And the reason why I did that is because most of them probably spent $25,000 this year in chasing this trail. And it was a fact of saying, you know what? I'm not taking from you. We're going to give back to you. We've got about a $60,000 investment in this tournament for this weekend just for the fact that I want the anglers to know it's not about taking money from you. It's about appreciating what you're doing, the investment that you're doing. And I think it's all pieces of those little parts. I don't think there's one thing to say, if you do this, then we're going to be as big as bass. 
I think it's, a, it's stepping stones. And I think when you trip, you have to evaluate that trip. Maybe it's still the right step, but you just did it the wrong way. And, and I think that's the learning curve that we've got to put in place and be honest. It's very territorial. The catfish world's very territorial. And the one thing that I'm trying to do is to smash that. I'm not in competition with MRM. I'm not in competition with Cat Masters. I'm not in competition with Alex Nagy and, and Twisted Cat or any of the other ones, the, the Big Bash Brawl or the, the Big Catfish Brawl in South Carolina. Well, I'm not in, they're not my competition. They're my allies. They're the people that love doing what we love to do. I'm not going to compete against them. And, and so I try to push them as much as we push ourselves. Uh, we're doing something special this weekend. And the person that wins, uh, the, the, that's on the Final Four that wins, they get a $2,500 from King Cat um, sponsorship. And they can take that $2,500 anytime this year and they can put it in any trail or any local club or anywhere that they want to go. If they fish it, show that they fished it, they send me the receipt, we're going to reimburse them their entry fee up to $2,500. All we ask is that you just say, hey, King Cat sponsored us for this thing. And then make sure that you are supporting that also. We're also going to do it for the bottom, uh, the ones that's out of the top five, the ones that has a combined weight for two days. Whoever has the biggest weight for the next two days, Friday and Saturday, they get an option to win $25 a sponsorship from from King Cat. I don't expect them to use it on us. I want them to go elsewhere, and 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 I that's part of what I'm trying to do is to push this, get more of a unity. I think ACA came on board and really wanted to try to do that. Um, it's not there yet. I've talked to Glenn a lot of times, you know, but there's it's a very tight knit four thousand people, and I'm happy they're there. We wouldn't be doing what we're doing today if some of them hadn't given us a shop. But if we want to change the industry, we need to say, okay, how do we reach the 18 million? I think Brian with Cat Masters, what he's trying to do moving forward and educate with, uh, with his um, elite tour that he's putting together. And I hear what he's saying is that we want to educate people while we're filming them on the water. I think that's a piece of the puzzle. And so I think there's all these little pieces of the puzzle that's got to come together. Whether it's King Cat that does it or it's all of us that do it, it doesn't matter. But I think if until we get out of the selfishness of I'm the best, I'm the best trail, you want to come and do mine, or I have the biggest payout, um, you won't accomplish it. I think you've got to do, we've got to elevate people because in the, in the bass world, you see the people. They're, they're elevated to where they are, and they're, they're the stars of, of, of really the of what's going on and then people connect to those people i think through the resources what you do what we're trying to do and other things that's going after i think we have a better chance now if we can keep the drama to a minimum and if we can keep a little more unity moving forward where we're not competing against each other all right so the business model sounds good sounds like it's beneficial for everybody why hadn't anybody done this have we just gotten locked into this paradigm of the bass tournament world, bring in five fish, keep them in a live well all day, you know, and why didn't anybody, why? I think we get comfortable. A lot of people are afraid of change, just in the, just in the world. There's a lot of people who don't like change. I'm a risk taker. I've been a risk taker. I've went for broke twice, been broke twice. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not afraid of failure. Um, I think failure is part of the steps moving forward. But I think in the world that we live in today, it's never pushed that it's, you're allowed to fail. And so I, but to, to, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I think that there is, I think there is some inklings of trying to bring change. You know, the, and I know the, the what am I saying? The, the anglers are important and we need to listen to them. I've told our team this, you know, um, I think it was uh, the Apple, you know, founder, Steve Jobs. And he said, the customer doesn't know what they want because we haven't told them yet. And I think, and that's not an insult to the anglers. It's a fact, no one's ever done a Sweet 16, you know? And everybody's like, wow, this is incredible. This is incredible. It, it was just something that we thought about to do. But again, I, and that's what I talked about earlier is I don't think that 
I don't think that there's this change that everybody's saying, well, there's got to be a change. I think there's an evolution that has to happen that people are afraid of. Or if you go through the door the first time and you get bloody, no one wants to get bloody again, you know, because then you get just devoured. I think as me as a leader, what I want to do is I want to be very transparent. You know, if I can get to Sweet 16 to get a payout first place of 100 grand, that's life changing. That's a life changing event. OK, especially if they're coming in for nothing. Well, it's really not nothing. They've invested all year to be here, you know, and why wouldn't then if you're saying 100 grand, it's just zeros. What do you got to do to get it to a million? Now that is life changing. Okay, and and I think you just have to look at it. A lot of people say we have a ten thousand dollar payout if seventy five boats show up. Okay, and I can put that out on all of ours. If we have a hundred, if I have two hundred seventy five boats, I'm gonna have this kind of a payout. We do. We have a hundred percent payout. All right. Now we had a small. We went to the Kansas City market at the end of the year. The Kansas City market had been completely destroyed by mismanagement of King Cat when they'd went there two or three years earlier. And we had 14 boats show up. And I sat down in the room, and we were 100% payout. And I went, you guys, we're not going to pay out 100%. We're going to pay out 200%. Because I want to show you, thank you for giving us an opportunity to show you that there's a change that's coming. And they were appreciative of that. I think we just have to sit down. We have to listen really good. We, we can't, I mean, there's two types of communication. One that talks and one that listens. And we don't listen good. And I think that's where we got to sit down and listen and say, okay, how, how do we make this change the way it needs to be? Some changes should happen quick, pull the Band-Aid off, move on. Um, you know, we talked earlier off camera about the difference between five fish and three fish. Who's to say it's got to be three fish? You know, who, who, who says that? Why, why can't it be two fish? Why can't it be one big one? You know, you can change it around a little bit, but I think you have to ask those questions. Will you disrupt the guys that like the things that's always going on? But again, if they don't know what they want, who's going to lead the direction to show them what they want? And, and maybe, maybe us as an industry can come together and say, yeah, um, you know, I don't want to do things half. If we can't do it full tilt, I don't want to do it. If we can't commit to it, I don't want to do it. Signature series right now. Everybody might look at and say it's going to be a bust. I have six teams signed up for it. Okay, 16 times $2,000 is 12 grand. We're going to guarantee 50,000 payout for the signature series. If I don't get anyone else to sign up for it, we're going to guarantee 50,000. Why? Because I believe it can be something in the next three years that will pay for itself and it will be beneficial to the anglers. So we're committed to it. I've had people come up to me that signed up for it. We don't expect you to do that. And I said, it's part of the system that I've put in place. We're going to pay out 50 grand. It'll be 30,000 first place. If there's only six people competing against each other, good luck. This is going to be fun to watch. And, and again, you have to put it across. It's not about putting money in Bob's pocket. God's blessed me where I, I can do other things that's done this. And so that heaviness is not on King Cat. Do we want to be sound? Yeah. And I've put people around me that will make us sound financially. But we also know that it's an investment. And we're going to be in doing an investment. If we can get it to where it's in the black within the next six to eight months, which it looks like it could be, then we're, we're right on track with what we want to do. Um, but I think change is hard for people. And I think it's hard to sit down and look in the mirror and say, you know what? We blew that one. That didn't work. That wasn't good for the industry. wasn't good for the anglers. wasn't good for the city wasn't good for the water, wasn't good for our resources. We need to stop. We need to stop for a minute and say, we blew this up and we failed in this one. Um, I think most people in the industry is afraid of that failure because of the repercussions that come with it. But I think you have to just be up there in front and be honest with them and say, we're going to try this. If it works, great. If it doesn't, bad on me. We've committed to the Signature Series for three years, and I'm doing it for one reason, because the elites want it. That's at least what they told me. Now, they're not supporting it, but that's what they told me. But we'll see, you know, in time. There's still people watching King Cat. We'll pass the test. I'm not worried about that. We'll pass the test. Um, that's one of the big debates out there. And there's been these big tournaments that have come up to where $5,000 entry fee. And they were able to sell the places. 
5,000 is about what you pay to enter an elite series BASS event, FLW. I mean, it, it's in that price range. But those guys are entering, how many of them, a dozen, nine to a dozen of them a year. Uh, Catfish World ever gonna do that? What a great question though. You know, do we ever see that, you know, that the catfish world will be into that? There's a dark side to those big $5,000 entry fees. And there's a lot of people that lose everything they have because they're chasing their dream. And they're willing to take the risk to lose everything they have. That's never reported. That's never talked about, okay? But there's more people that's hurt on that industry, not that industry, but in that mindset that I'm gonna go and do everything I can, I'm gonna go for broke, and then they go broke. And there's only a small handful that actually gets to get just almost like an NBA player or the person that goes plays the lottery. I don't wanna be part of anything like that that is gonna put that risk out there. As a company and, and, and a, as a business, and we know what our customer is, that we need to take that risk, not expect our customer to take that risk. Now, do I know how to get there? I don't know how to get there, all right? I just don't. Um, so um, we've had a lot of success over you know, the years in business. People's my business. I, I love people, and, I, and, I, um, and so I'm bringing a lot of that to the table. Am I an expert in it? Nope. Um, am I an expert failure? Biggest failure in the room. Yep, I'm the biggest failure in the room, but I've learned off all of them. And, and I think that experience has brought me to where we're at today, and I'm willing to take the risk to say, can we infiltrate this industry and make it what the industry want, what it, it's going to be, and we don't know what that is. I'd, I can't sit here and say I got a, a crystal ball. Well, I wish it could be like bass. I want it to be like catfish is what I want, because bass is bass. Crappie's crappie. Let, let's make it catfish, and, and let's see where it is, you know? And if I can be a small part of that to move in, it in, that, in that direction, then I've done what I've wanted to do. And, and I wanted to take something that was wounded, that was hurt, look at it, and say, can we, is there a leader that can step up in the front and say, let's take it to this spot, and let's see where we go from here. The end result of what I would like to see is that it becomes what catfish has always wanted to become. And that when we look at it, and I'm old looking back at it, some of the people are saying, we never knew it could be like this. Because I don't know if we know what it, it's supposed to look like because we're comparing it to everything else. Let's just keep it to catfish. And let's see what goes with it. You know, there's so many bank anglers out there. Uh, there there's so many noodlers, you know. Um, there's so many people that just are going out with their, their nephew for the first time because there's a real problem at home. And they're saying, come on, Bobby, let's go fishing. That is there every day. If we can bring some kind of help to them and say, how can we make you to be a better angler? We've won. Your uncle, whether he knew it or not, was a healer. Like you, he had you and was, you come from some broken pieces. Yep. What do you think he thinks about mm. what he instilled in you and what you're doing now? Uh, Uncle Bill died. I didn't get to see him uh, before he passed away several years ago. Um, and they were rushing him to the hospital and he died on his way to the hospital. Um, Uncle Bill was truly a hero for me. Um, he believed in me, um, and, and just by that alone, I, I was the only boy in the family, um, probably should have been on medication, because <laughs> I was pretty rat, I mean, I just was, I was all over the place, and, and, and my grandmother just did not, she was older in her age, she just did not know how to raise a rambunctious boy like me, and Uncle Bill did, you know, he only had three girls, he never had his own boy. So I think there was a little piece of that was like, come on, Bob, let's go. You know, come on, boy. Uh, taught me how to work. You know, he'd take me on job sites and we'd paint and do things like that. Um, I would hope that he's looking down on me and, and being proud of me. Um, but again, we come back to legacy. You know, Uncle Bill worked every day. Was never in front of a camera. Um, just, 
you know, worked, came home, fished, provided for his family, and enjoyed the time that he had on the water, and instilled that in me at a very young age. Even though I walked away for it for years and never did it until I got back into crappie fishing. Um, but there's how many of that, it, it, there's the sad part. There's less of that going on today than any other time in the history of our country. How can we tweak that to try to get that back a little bit? Where we have, the problem I have with most of the kids that live at our residential, no parents. They don't have parents or they don't have a full family or they've watched dad shoot mom or they've watched their mom die of a drug overdose in front of them, you know. And, and there's that missing piece within our culture of our world that, that I don't know if we'll ever get it back, but just maybe, just maybe I've been put in this position for this time that I can tell enough stories and we can touch enough people that are going to come and try to look for a, a jumbo catfish that the little kid's going to be sitting there going, I'm going to go catch that fish one day. Our daddy looks at him and says, you want to go try to catch that tomorrow? And then we sit down and we hook that, that father and that son or that grandparent with that child and we say, hey, come here. They just won the tournament. You want to talk to them? Want to get some pictures with them? I think that's how, that's, I think that's the pieces of the puzzle. And you can't do it overnight. It, it's, not going to, it's going to come with a lot of work. And, and really trying to infiltrate in and understand who's our customer. And my customer is that little boy that needs to be taken out by an Uncle Bill and fished with and having a good time. I remember Uncle Bill caught a 40 pound catfish. Every time we would never catch, but just little ones. And he caught a 40 pound catfish on, on the corner of Wills Creek in, uh, up there at Catfish you know, Basket. And he brought it home that day. And he cleaned it and all the neighbors showed up and we had a little fish fry. And that was the only time. And I remember his face, everybody you know, just going around and patting him on the back. And it was the biggest catfish I ever saw in my life. And now I'm seeing them, you know, 40 pounder is nothing for some of these blues that's coming in at 60, 80, 90 pounds, okay? But every time I see that big fish come out, I see that smile on that angler's face, I get a flashback to Uncle Bill. And I get that feeling of what he had at that moment when he caught it. And he didn't have the equipment that we've got today. He didn't have the electronics that we have today. He was sitting on a bank that was 10 foot down to the water. And we had sticks that was broken off of twigs. And that's how we set our line up. And it was a very simple life. We had a little fire that was on next to it. And we just sat there and we talked. Some nights we got a bite, some nights we didn't. And, and so when I see those big fish come in, um, our, one, our team went out last night catfishing here. And, and Trevor, one of our younger guys that's on our team and never caught a big flathead, caught a 60 pounder last night. And they sent me the video and he was losing his mind of holding this fish. You know, um, so I would hope that Uncle Bill would be proud. I would hope that everybody that's gone on before me would be proud. Um, and I hope that when it's all said and done, that when I'm gone, someone will be proud and say, you know, wow, look at look at what has happened. Um, whether I get to see that, I don't know. But we're going to try to put the building blocks in place. We're rattling things up a little bit. OK. Um, I'm hoping everybody understand it's not about taking anyone out. It's not. It's about helping completely. I called all the big, the big ones first month that I was on. I said, we have production company. Whatever you need from us will come on board. And I don't think they, I, I, I don't know if they even thought that there was an angle that I wanted. Um, but there's no angles with Bob Denon. Um, it's, I want to do, I want to do the job the right way. And I want to see where it's going to go. We're going to make the investment. I don't have to make a living to do this. So that frees me up. That frees me up to say, okay, what is it that we've got to do to move forward? Would I like to be able to do something in life if it starts making money? Yeah, I think I would. I'd like to pour more money into local clubs is what I'd like to do. I'd say, how do we back you? How do we stick you up? How do we provide more for you? Now you're a national trail. Now you're a national trail. Well, there you go, guys. I hope y'all enjoyed that. Um, I found it. He's one of the, the, the best guests I've had on here. It was a very good discussion. The thing I like about him, I told him this. I basically fed him one or two line questions, and he talked 
a bunch. You didn't have to look at me and listen to me talk. And I love that in the podcast. So Bob, thank you uh, for being as open as you were. There were no punches pulled. There was uh, pretty much everything was on the table. Uh, There was no out of bounds or, uh, you know, off topic, off the table discussions, which I like. I think he was honest and uh, very forthright with the way he's got going on. So check him out, kingcack.com. You know, it'll be interesting to watch and see what happens with this series over the next several years. And, uh, you know, post your feedback. Uh, He's going to see this video and uh, go down in the comment section if you're watching on YouTube and uh, leave some comments down there in that section. Uh, about what you think about the series, uh, what you think about catfish tournaments uh, in general. I'm going to do a few more of these as the year goes on. This is not turning into a catfish tournament podcast channel by any means, but I think some educated and healthy discussion about this may lead to some positive impacts. He's already changed a few things. I will scold him for one thing. Uh, And uh, Bob, if you're watching and listening, this is my one slap on the wrist to you. Uh, you need to make uh, social media broadcasts during the tournaments legal. Right now in your rules, the way they're written, I cannot fish one of your tournaments and live stream during that tournament. I think that's a horrible mistake. I think that's a horrible marketing, uh, 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 just lack of marketing right there. Uh, the fact that if somebody wants to broadcast to the world where they're sitting and fishing at, then... They should be able to do that, especially if they are promoting that tournament to the masses out there. So that's my take on it, Bob. I had to give you a little slap on the wrist for something because, honestly, I like everything else you're doing, and I keep doing it. We're watching, and I think you're a great positive influence in the sport. So that's it for now, folks. We'll catch you out on the water.